Hello and welcome to Undercurrent Stories. In today's show, I'm delighted to be joined by James Cooper. James is a Christmasologist and hosts whychristmas.com, a world-famous Christmas website, which each December receives over 20 million page loads. Having appeared on the BBC News, BBC Radio 2, Radio 5 Live and many other media outlets, James is a highly regarded Christmas expert. Hello and welcome to the show, James. Well, hello, Bob, and thank you very much for having me. Great to have you on. So uh, I guess an uh, obvious question, which I'll have to ask, especially for the listeners, is busy time for you at the moment? Uh, yeah, it does get slightly busy around this time of year, I have to say. Yeah, I bet, I bet it does. Um, <laughs> I, I was looking on your on your website and um, you're described as a Christmasologist and it's sort of said afterwards, yes, there is such a word. I personally never heard it, but it's it's that's that sort of sums you up, does it? Well, yeah, it's it's sort of a term that's been coined over the years um, by people like me who've like are well into Christmas, shall we say? Yes, yes. No, it's a, a very special time. Um, but before before we talk about the history of celebrating Christmas in the UK, which is obviously what the um, the theme of the show is, can you just please tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, you, you know, your story and your journey, and how you became so interested in Christmas, please? Yeah, sure. Well, sort of by accident, basically. Um, It all started in the year 2000. I was just cutting my teeth as a web designer in North London and um, some friends who were teachers came to me and they worked at a local primary school. And this was at the infancy of the web. And they said, James, why can't we find a website that's child friendly, that has Christmas information and isn't trying to sell them anything? Because back then you had the likes of Disney doing um, kids websites that had a bit of information about Christmas and stuff yes but really the points of the site was, was to sell their DVDs and toys and things um, so being a big kid um, <laughs> loving Christmas um, I thought it'd be fun to make a little website for a school learn a bit more about web design learn a bit more about Christmas and it'd be a fun little project little did I ever imagine that 22 years later it would now be one of the biggest Christmas sites on the web I'd be one of the most knowledgeable people in the world which still really baffles my brain about christmas <laughs> and it would take up most of my december wow so you're still doing your web design yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's my day job and this, and this is like it, a sort of giant, it just sort of yeah it slows hobby. down somewhat yeah. in um in december and yeah i yeah. go into christmas mode and thankfully i have some understanding clients that uh, yeah. can cope with that <laughs> okay so yeah you sort of answered my my next question which is going to be what inspired you to start it but it was it was the teacher friends that you had that yeah. wanted you to do something for them yeah that's no, fantastic um just for listeners could you tell tell us a bit, bit about the types of content available on the site please? yeah sure um the site's in four main sections there's a christmas customs and tradition section which is where you can find out about anything to do with the history and the customs of Christmas, like why we send Christmas cards, why we have Christmas trees, um, where stockings came from, where Santa arrived from, what about all those candy canes, all that sort of stuff. Um, There's Christmas around the world, which is getting on for nearly 100 countries, how they celebrate it around the world um, with information on that. That must have taken a lot of research. Yeah, it's it's all taken a lot of research and, and a lot of the content for Christmas around the world has wonderfully come from visitors to the site to around the world who they say, We've seen you got your country, but you haven't got this information or you haven't got this country. Please, can you add it? I had last week, um, I had a person from Guyana visit the site and say, yeah. hey, here's some information about Christmas in Guyana. There's now a page about Christmas in Guyana. Wow. Um, there's a section about the Christmas story, the history behind it. I'm a Christian, so that's an important part of Christmas to me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sort of dispelling some of the nativity story ness around Christmas, like Jesus actually wasn't born in a stable um, and things like that, you know, what the wise men might have seen and that sort of stuff. And there's a Christmas fun and and activities section where you can make an online nativity scene, you can decorate an online tree, there's Christmas karaoke and quizzes and crosswords and all that sort of stuff as well. Yeah, well, I I had a, I say I had a quick look, I I had quite a long look at your site and and it's so extensive that there's a lot of stuff to see for people. Yeah, um, I I go back to it because sort of most of the year I'm not that Christmas inclined, you know, I'm getting on with other work and it comes back and I sort of get back into Christmas mode, November, December, and I I sort of have a re look at the site and go, yeah, there's actually a lot of stuff on here. Yeah. Yeah. And there's still no ads on the site. That's a very important thing. I I did Um, notice that actually. Yeah. Yeah, It's because of, because of the teacher thing. I've been offered big ads. I bet you have. Big money over the years. Always say no. Um, Yeah. I've got it set up now in a way that although it gets millions of page loads, it's actually very 
elegantly run so it doesn't actually cost me that much to no, run which no, is good no so what, what's the most important part of christmas for you james um i really love christmas music in all its flavors and genres i love carols and i love the sort of more commercially wacky stuff um i've got over 400 christmas albums in my digital collection which wow. is slightly daft um and i'll happily listen to christmas music any time of year, yeah. which when you've got that many albums, you kind of need to, to have a listen to. Yeah, I, I think um, we, we don't, we, you know, nobody goes to the high street shopping as much as they used to, I don't think. Um, so a lot of people are at home buying online or the rest of it. There's nothing quite like going into a store just before Christmas. I, I don't mean in October. I, I mean sort of <laughs> mid-December yeah. onwards and, and hearing those hearing those sort of famous songs um, when you go in. I think it, it conjures up a great atmosphere. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I quite agree that although I love Christmas, um, I don't like to inflict it on other people as much as I like it. And so, yeah, I think I think Christmas music in shops before December is just wrong, basically. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think we both we both agree on that one. <laughs> um, so just talking about the history, because I know that we, you know, one or two listeners have, have asked me to do this particular one about the history of Christmas in the UK. Um, and apologies to, to those people outside of the UK. Maybe next year we can do something from some other countries and we may, may even touch on some some stuff that's celebrated in other countries. But what do we know about when Christmas was first celebrated in the UK? Because obviously we're talking about um, over 2,100 years ago now. So yeah. what, what do we know um, about when it first when it was first celebrated? Wait, no, one's, no one's really sure. I mean, uh, early Christianity had come to um, England, certainly, in sort of the late 300s when the Roman M- when the Roman uh, Empire was being Christianized. But there's no records that Christmas was celebrated as such in the UK at that time. When the Romans went out, there was more of a focus on Celtic Christianity. Yeah. And they probably did celebrate Christmas. But again, there are no records. The earliest recorded date of Christmas in England is from 597, which is two years after um, Augustine arrived in, in England to sort of as the official popes go and Christianize the English yeah. type of thing. Um, and it's recorded that on um, Christmas Day in um, 597, he baptized 10,000 Saxons in Kent. Um, oh, that was a busy day for him. Yeah. And you th- well, I hope the sea was a bit warmer than it is at the moment. <laughs> it would have been a bit nippy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's the first dating of um, a celebration of Christmas in the UK. Yeah. And then, and then, the, on the in terms of the actual traditions themselves, um, could you just sort of go through what you found out, what we know, and when they first started, and the sorts yeah, of traditions that went on? Yeah, I mean, there's sort of a bit of a, a crossover between sort of the pre-Christian midwintery festivals that had happened throughout Northern Europe for hundreds of years. I mean, the dating of Christmas Day is quite interesting in itself that, you know, you'll often hear, oh, it was taken over from the pagan winter festivals. Well, partly, but it also dates to early monks dating the death of Jesus to March the 25th, and then them thinking that the birth and the death happened on the same day. Yeah, And so, and then the birth came to the conception and of course nine months after march the 25th being the conception of jesus is december the 25th so it sort of all got put together um the 12 days of christmas which was a big feature of english and european um christmases all the way up to the industrial revolution uh, that came about in sort of the 500s when the Western Church by this time was definitely celebrating Christmas on December the 25th, but the Eastern Church um, was still hanging on to January the 6th, as they still do today, yeah. where they also ce- um, celebrate Epiphany. So uh, a church council meeting said, well, why don't we have Christmas from December the 25th to January the 6th? Because it keeps everyone happy. <laughs> <laughs> so thus the 12 days of Christmas was born. Uh, right, that's interesting. Um, And we have in the ninth century, King Alfred, the King of Wessex, declaring in England um, that the 12 days of Christmas would be a time of celebration and no work should be done. Um, And that course also ties in with the farms, sort of the grounds in the farms being sort of nigh on and workable. So it was kind of a, a good time for that. And yeah, the 12 days of Christmas were really the thing. And then Advent came in as the time leading up to Christmas, which was your more religious time um certainly 
very religious people and the monks and the priests and everything would be doing fasting during Advent. Yeah. And then you really let go during the 12 days of Christmas and they were your big party days. And 12th night, um, that was your big party. Not a lot of change um, in that respect, has it? No, I mean, more we, we have much less of Advent now. Yes. Um, with I'm jumping on several hundred years, um, and I know we'll come on to do um, the Victorian and the Georgians later. Um, but when the Industrial Revolution came in um, and they wanted people working in the factories, you had Christmas Day and Boxing Day off, but oh, then yeah. you were back to work. Yeah. So all of the stuff that had happened after Christmas, like your Christmas parties and your, your revelries, got shifted to before Christmas. Right. Um, which is now why we have Christmas music before Christmas and you put your Christmas decorations up before Christmas rather than it happening on Christmas Eve. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we you, in the uh, medieval and the Tudor period, uh, which is where we start getting really good records of Christmas things, although most of them come from um, the rich gentries and the royals because they were the people that were writing stuff down. Of course. Um, um, yeah, that's when we know um, Christmas Day and the Christmas feasts really, really became a thing. Um, yeah, in 1170 and 1171, they were rather eventful. In 1170, in the um, town of Burr in France, Thomas Beckett was killed on the order of Henry II. Um, and in 1171, uh, Christmas was rather different for Henry because he had a massive Christmas celebration in Dublin. He basically wanted to go over and swank to the Irish to show how wealthy he was. Yeah. There were swans, peacocks, and even a crane served as the Christmas dish. Wow. Um, the Irish basically were not impressed and refused to eat anything. <laughs> <laughs> but Henry just sat there scoffing it up. Um, and possibly the most remarkable thing about we know about that meal is the entertainments that follow it, which included dwarf tossing. <laughs> I don't know what that involved. It's just written down that it had yeah. dwarf tossing. And there was a jester, which was a favourite of, of Henry II, who was colloquially known as Ronald the Farter. <laughs> Again, don't know his act, but he was there. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. Um, uh, some other decent Christmas feasts. Um, uh, King John in 1213, his feast included 420 boar's heads, 16,000 chickens, 15,000 herrings, 100 pounds of almonds, and 500 pounds of wax just for the candles. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, it um, must have been a few people there celebrating it with him. I, I would think so, yes. I mean, there are records of um, nobles and sort of your rich local gentry inviting the poor people round for Christmas meals. Yeah. But they generally had them with the servants rather than with the rich people. I see. Um, and it, the boar's heads that I mentioned there, it sounds very odd to us that, you know, oh, let's have a boar's head for Christmas. That's, you know, but it was a traditional meal for centuries. Yes. In fact, I, there's, um, I, I think it, I think it's Steel, Steel Eye Spam. One of the folk groups have got a, got an old English song yeah. about the boar's head. Yeah. Boar's head carol. That goes yes. back to the 15th century. Does it? Yeah. Wow. Um, and it was a bit like, um, you still have today at, um, Burns night where you pipe and sing in the haggis. Yes. Um, you, you sang that carol as you paraded your boar's head around the Christmas table before you started eating it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and around this time, um, you were getting the infancy of Christmas puddings, Christmas cake and mince pies, although they were rather different to what we have today. Christmas pudding started as basically an oat or wheat porridge called frumen tea. Yeah. It was eaten all year round just with um, milk and your wheat or your oats. But at Christmas, um, if you were rich enough, you'd chuck in some dried fruit and things like these new exotic spices called cinnamon and nutmeg um, because you were really rich to afford such things and even a bit of sugar. But to prove you were also rich, you'd throw in some meat and possibly some beer. So it was like basically beer porridge. Yeah, the beer would, would be OK, I think, but but meat with it, with, with a sweet. Yeah, well, it's very strange. Hence the name mince pies, yeah, yeah. because they started with minced lamb in them. And again, with your dried fruit and your sugar and your spices. And as your sugar and your spices 
became cheaper over the years. The meat went out and more nice things as we think of them today <laughs> went in. And hence, we still have the mince pies, but thankfully no meat in them. Incredible that the name still carried on. Yeah, yeah. And back then, Christmas cake wasn't eaten at Christmas. You had Twelfth Cake, which was eaten at the big Twelfth Night parties. Okay. Um, and in it, the Twelfth Cake then, it wasn't such a rich fruit cake like we have today. It was more like Italian panettone. Yeah. Um, and in it was cooked an almond. And at the Twelfth Parties, whoever found the almond would be the Lord or Lady of Misrule, who would rule over the Twelfth Night Parties. Um, and it was during Victorian times that the Twelfth Night cake became a Christmas cake that your Victorian ladies could eat at their afternoon teas rather than at blowout parties. Oh, I see. And the almond got transferred from the cake into the Christmas pudding, which again had become richer and more sugary and denser over the years. So yeah, it's all lots of these things date back hundreds of years, but not in a form that we have them today. No, it's, it's amazing how they've evolved over time yeah. and will probably continue to do so. Yes, I, th- I think so. Um, the, we also get the first turkey brought into the UK. Yeah. And that was in 1526. Um, and it's thought that the first king to eat a turkey was uh, Henry VIII, although we don't quite know when. Yeah, throughout the Tudor period in the Middle Ages, you also had um, the custom of boy bishops. I don't know if you've heard of those. Well, I've vaguely heard of them, but if you could elaborate, yeah. that'd be great. It, it's Thank kind you. of like the religious version of the Lord of Misrule. Um, boys, normally at cathedrals or monastery schools, um, were elected as a bishop on the 6th of December, oh, which yeah. is St. Nicholas Day. Yeah. And they held the authority of a bishop even to perform masses. Really? Until the 28th of December. Wow. Um, Henry VIII banned it because he thought when he was sort of diverging himself from Catholicism, um, it briefly came back under Mary I as she was reinstated Catholicism. But then Elizabeth I chucked it out when she really kicked out Catholicism. Yes. Catholicism. And of course, at that time, it was also illegal to practice um, Catholicism and you could be jailed for having a Catholic Bible or even killed. Yeah. Um, one of the, the carols that we have today, the 12 days of Christmas, um, there's sort of an urban legend around that, that it was a, a carol or a song that sort of smuggled in Catholic meanings for the different 12 days of Christmas. Um, but that's kind of a bit of a, of a legend. Um, the, the story behind it really is that it was basically a folk song. Um, there was another um carol around that time yeah. that was a catholic one and it called a new dial and it was also called in those 12 days just to confuse you even mm-hmm. more and that goes back to 1625 so a bit later than the tudors um but it, again it wasn't a secret thing it was just a, like here's a way to remember stuff um it was sort of really um in the Victorian period that the legends about, oh, this was a secret Catholic song came around. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And the bit after the sort of Tudor period going, going through Charles I and Charles II and, and the um, Cavaliers and Roundheads, did anything happen then at all? Uh, well, yeah. Christmas wasn't a thing for uh, quite a while, um, especially up in Scotland. Um, we, we hear about the, the banning of Christmas and it's normally the fingers pointed at Oliver Cromwell. Yeah. Um, somewhat unjustly. He was around and he certainly approved of it, but he wasn't responsible for the banning. Um, Christmas was first banned up in Scotland in 1560, oh, right. which is very early, yeah. under John Knox, um, who was the founder of the Presbyterian Church of Scotland and was very heavily early in on the anything Catholicism get out basically. Yes. Um, by 1575, it, it was known as Yule's Day rather than Scot- uh, in Scotland rather than Christmas Day. Um, and there were punishments for anyone found dancing, playing or singing filthy carols upon that day. Um, it was briefly reinstated in 1602 by King James I. Did the Scots not go to church on Christmas Day then? Only if it was a Sunday. And mm-hmm. that was much the case when it was banned in England as yeah, well. Yeah. 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 Um, it was seen as basically a Catholic sort of hangover of pagan old traditions of uh, midwinter festivals. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also because of the veneration of Mary as part of the Christmas story, um, that sort of extra did it in for him. <laughs> yes. Um, 
So it briefly came back for about 30 years under King James. Um, but because it had been sort of nothing Christmassy had been happened for Scotland for 40 years by that point, basically no one was bothered. Yeah. So when it was fully banned in 1640, um, that was it. You might not actually believe it, but Christmas was only made a public holiday in Scotland in 1958. Wow. That is amazing. That is am- <laughs> yeah. I have to say that my, my perception, it might be wrong, but my perception is that the um, the Scottish tend to sort of go more for New Year's Day, New Year's Eve, yes. rather yes. than Christmas. And, and that's why. Yes, I can see that. Because they, they basically point. transferred all of their revelry that they had had at Scotland, is in sorry, at Christmas, over to New Year's Eve. Yes. And um, there's actually interesting echoes of that in post-communist, in post, in communist post-World War II Europe. Um, in Russia and still lots of Eastern, um, the so-called old Eastern bloc countries that are now, you know, they have Christmas again. Yeah. But New Year is still a bigger deal. And rather than Santa coming on December the 25th, you have Grandfather, Cro- Grandfather Frost, who was the communist Santa, who comes on December the 23rd. Grandfather 20- Frost. That's yeah. interesting. And he, he, he wears blue rather than red and yeah. um, travels around with his granddaughter. Yeah, so, so Scotland was already done away with Christmas. Yeah. Um, and England and Wales and Ireland, it started in the mid-1640s um, um, and until the 1660s when the um, Charles II yes. uh, was put back on the throne. Yeah. Um, and then it was so, a par- yeah. party from then on, I think, wasn't it? Uh, pretty, much, pretty much, yeah. W- when it came back, it came back big time. Did anything develop through um, the Charles II period uh yeah really the the reinstating of the 12 days of christmas again yes. and that was um it re- and then going from that period into the georgian period when things like your sugars and your spices were becoming more common um it really kicked it up another gear yeah in the Georgian period, because the Georgians really like to party. Well, especially if you're rich. Yeah, and, and I guess with a lot of wealth starting to come in. Uh, yeah, you, 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 had, lots, lots of, you had lots of opportunities to show off your wealth. Yeah, especially with um, sugars and alcohols, yeah. you know, because you had all of your rums coming over from the West Indies and your sugars and all the new spice routes coming over from India as well. So it was a, it was really the time that the flavours that we associate with Christmas started to becoming more mainstream that even normal people could afford a bit of sugar and a few spices and some um, dried fruits. Yes. Yes. It does seem up until now that the, it, it does tend to be the more affluent people that are able to celebrate Christmas more than the, the working, yeah, the poor, the I mean, poor working you, people. Your average people would have had your, the days off, yeah. but they might have had a little bit of meat to eat if they were lucky but yeah, um, and they might have been allowed to take a bit of holly and ivy to string around the place if the um, Lord of the Manor allowed them, or if he'd already had it for his place, then good luck to him. Yeah. And so then I guess we fast forward to the Victorian period. Yeah. Uh, one one crucial thing that the Georgians um, brought to us was kissing under mistletoe. Oh, was it? Interesting. Yeah. Um, um, it's the story of mistletoe is said to go back to sort of pre-Christian times when Druids would, um, you know, harvest it under a full moon with a golden sickle. But there's basically no evidence for any of that. No. Um, it had been associated with Norse um, mythology as a symbol of peace yes. um, for centuries. But nobody's really quite sure how it got turned into the kissing thing. It appears in 1784 in a musical comedy. And there's a song about kissing under the mistletoe. Um, it probably started around the 1720s to get picked up in like contemporary culture yeah. um, by then. And in the 1700s, in the British forerunners of Christmas trees, because they didn't arrive over here until pretty late, um, you had a thing called a Christmas bow or a kissing bow, which was basically two hula hoops or, or even up to five hula hoops that were put together in the shape of a ball and were covered in holly and ivy and other greenery. And they had a sprig of mistletoe hanging from the bottom of it. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, so that's how um, mistletoe come, comes into it. And again, during the Victorian period, um, mistletoe was probably really kicked off in 1843, which is like the year for Christmas. Um because it was when um, A Christmas Carol was published 
And there was a picture of a, in one of the early administrations in Christmas Carol was a couple kissing under a sprig of mistletoe. So if you hadn't heard about it by then, um, you would have done in that book. Yeah. So are most of the, the Christmas carols that we sing, are they, are they Victorian? Basically, yes. Yeah. Um, they, the Victorians went round, a couple of guys um, went round collecting English folk tunes um, and either took the words and the tunes as they were, or they sort of muddled them together yes. to turn them into a lot of the carols that we have today. Interesting. The earliest carol that we know of as being like properly traditional is while shepherds watch their flocks, um, because that was the only one that was allowed in the um, Book of Common Prayer in the Anglican Church. Yeah, basically because all of the lyrics are lifted straight out of the Bible. <laughs> Oh right. So like it, it was allowed and yes. it was published in the um the this the um, Book of Common Prayer from the year seventeen hundred. Yeah. Um but most carols that we have today are yeah, are Victorians. Okay. The, the sort of picture I have of Victorian times at Christmas are are people with lots of clothes on skating on the River Thames. Yes. Yeah, and and again that's down to um Charles Dickens is majorly responsible for that because when he was growing up England was going through the end of what's known as the mini ice age yeah. when you had the frost fairs on the Thames. Yeah. Um so although coming into 1843 when he was writing the Pickwick papers and um a Christmas carol that had lots of snowy scenes in. Yeah. It wasn't actually as guaranteed as you think from looking at early Christmas cards. Oh right. Um which were also sent in 1843. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the year of the first Christmas card as well. Was it? Um, and Christmas trees came into England in the 1790s through Queen Charlotte, who was um, of German ancestry, because yeah. they Christmas trees had been a thing in Germany for several hundred years by that point, but they just hadn't got over here. Right. Um, she's the first person to record it putting up a, a branch of a yew tree in Windsor Castle. And in 1800, she put a whole tree up as a proper Christmas tree for a kid's party at Windsor Castle. Um, and Christmas trees really became the thing that everybody had to have um, after 1848, um, when a drawing of the British royal tree um, with um, Victoria and Albert and the kids standing around it yeah. was published in the London Illustrated News. Um, and that was sort of the becoming of the Christmas tree. And was that um, the re- traditional sort of Norway spruce? Yes. Well, the the traditional, um, what you can get out of Germany type spruce, yes. but basically, yeah, yeah the, the forests that covered that part of Europe. Yeah, yeah. And, and would the, the sort of, we keep talking about the working people here, but um, um, would the working people have had, you know, in, in the late 19th century, would, the, would they have had Christmas trees up in their houses? It was starting to, yeah. Um, they they became more of a thing. You would have still probably had lots of holly and ivy because they'd been around for hundreds of years. Yeah. But if you could afford it, you would start having um, a tree. Um, in It was in the 1880s, 1890s that glass baubles were first imported from Germany. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of when it was becoming more of a thing. Um, the first Christmas card was sent in 1843. Uh, you'd had the advent of the penny post at that time. Yes. Um, a few years later, it went to a halfpenny post, which again allowed it to become more affordable. Okay, so in, in, in the sort of from 1850 onwards, the majority of people were sending each other Christmas cards. It, they were becoming much more common. Yeah. 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 I mean, the first card was published basically as a way of bragging, hey, I'm, I'm a rich person who can ascend to full, send, afford to send these things out to my friends. Yeah. And it also happens that the guy who invented the Christmas card was um, uh, one of the people that was responsible for setting up the post office. Yeah. So he kind of had a good reason for trying to want to get people to send lots of things through the post. We're going to cover World War One and World War Two shortly, but there's one question I'd just like to ask on the Christmas cards is with, I mean, if we, we, we zoom up to present day, um, with WhatsApp and Facebook messages and, and texts and video phone and all the rest of it. Do you think there's still a place for a card or, or do you think they're going to gradually fade out? That's a really, really interesting question. Um, they've, I think sort of the the 70s and 80s were the like peak of Christmas cardness. And I think you're right. I think they, I think they will survive, but yeah. in a much less common format. Yeah. Um, I think with digital and also I've noticed speaking to people on social media with the postal strikes and also just the cost of postage now. Yes. Um, 
you know, if you're spending 60p a card or something, you know, you know, that's, that adds up. It, it does. Yeah. And, and I must admit, I, cards, um, I, I, I do like to receive cards from perhaps people that I very, very, very rarely see, or I'm in contact with by text or phone. That's, that's always quite a nice feeling. Yeah. And, and I think that's probably, I think your, your close family and distant people are probably where the cards will hang on the most as like sort of the yearly thing. Yes. Um, yeah. It might be sort of all of your vague acquaintances that you're, you know, you see at work every day. Why do you need to send them a card? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Good. Thank you for that. Just going back to after the Victorian you know, get into the Edwardian period and World War One. What what sort of went on then? Were there many changes? Yeah, I um, again going into the Edwardian period, you it was you know you had your big Christmas parties. They were coming out of the Victorian period. Again, more it was becoming more commercialised. People could afford to spend more. Um, that uh, really halted abruptly with the world arriving of World War One. Yeah. Um, during the late Victorian period and certainly all through the Edwardian period. Basically, all the toys that we had, especially tin plate toys, came from Germany because that's where they were all made. Um, and it basically stopped in um, at the advent of World War One. Yeah, I bet it did because um, they wanted to put their metal to other uses. I should, obviously, yeah, yeah. And as did paper, because of course, lots of paper was processed on the continent and came over as well. So, yeah. um, your wrapping paper and your, your paper for Christmas cards as well suddenly ran out did that mean that in the uk we got toys made out of different materials yeah i mean some some um they were sort of put on not as much of a war footing as we associate with world war ii now but certainly there were big cutbacks and you were going back to more of your wooden toys because we had some of those and and things like homemade soldiers' uniforms and stuff became quite fashionable during the war as well because you know dad was off in the trenches yeah yeah um, so let's have little Johnny dressed up as a soldier, yeah. which we might think of as a bit grim now, but um, that's what they did. Yes, yes. What happened actually between the wars? It became, it came back between the wars, although not as big as it had been before. No. Um, you had things like turkeys were becoming more popular. I mean, one great story about turkeys is that certainly during the, Victor- uh, the Georgian period and into Victorian period, um, they were all up in Norfolk. Yes. And they used to walk the turkeys down to market at Smithfields in London. Um, and they used to create little tyres on the turkeys' feet by getting them to walk through tar and then sand and grit. No. So you'd basically create um, turkey feet sandpaper. Yeah, gracious. All the way from, from their... Norfolk to London. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I grew up in Enfield in North London, yeah. um, and there was a road about five minutes' walk from where I grew up called Turkey Street. And that was where they camped the turkeys for the final night before they walked them down into London. Beggars believe that, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, by the time the Victorians had come along, you had the train. So you trained your turkeys down because it was a bit cheaper than and a bit quicker than spending three weeks walking down with your turkeys. Yes, I guess it would have taken about that that length of time, wouldn't it? Yeah. I wouldn't have thought there'd be a lot of meat left. Well... (laughs) I think they were sort of slightly different to what we think of the turkeys these days. Anyway, they had they sort of a bit, a bit more darker meat, should we say? Uh, okay, yeah, probably a little bit more free range, I would think. Uh, yeah, yeah, decidedly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the big thing in Christmas uh, in um, World War One is the you know the famous Christmas truce. Yes, um, but that that's been sort of romanticised over the years, and sort of the image of um, Tommies and the German playing football. Yeah, there there are records of a few kickabouts happening, but you know they're in no man's land that wasn't exactly flat. No. Um, so yeah, there were there were certainly meetings, but it didn't happen everywhere. Um, there were lots of fighting throughout the war on Christmas Day, and the one in 1914 was the only real time of cessations of hostilities. Yes. Um, because once it happened once, the commanders on both sides decided, you know, we can't have these people getting along too well or they no. won't want to kill each other. No, exactly. So back, <laughs> back to all, Lance. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, we go into World War Two. Yeah. Is it much the same? You know, metal toys uh, yes. are pushed to the background, I guess. Shortages yeah. and much more rationing. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was much more rationing during World War Two than there was during World War One. Um, and of course there were the bombings and the air raids 
Um, the, the, incidentally, the first air raid did happen in the UK during World War One on Christmas Day. Did it? Oh, right. The first bomb in, ever dropped in the UK was on, um, I think it was 1915 or 1916 over um, Kent somewhere. Yeah. But um, yeah, but I mean, yeah, the Christmas in World War Two, um, you know, you see, you they still put on Christmas TV every year the old Dad's Army Christmas episodes where they're doing the the rationing of the turkey dinners and stuff. Yes, and yeah, I mean that's actually pretty true to um, what happened. Things like the WVS, the Women's Voluntary Service, they really stepped up to create um, Christmas meals for people, especially in cities where they'd been bombed out. Um, you decorated, you know, you made your paper chains out of newspaper, you wrapped your presents in whatever bits of paper you could find. The, um, there's records of people even making Christmas decoration out of the metal chaff that the German planes dropped on bombing raids really? to try and deflect the radar. Amazing. Um, yeah. I remember as a child in the 1960s, actually at school, making paper chains out of newspaper and then painting them. Yeah. So it must have carried on a little bit. Great fun doing yeah, it. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, and, and things like um, rabbit was an alternative to turkey. Yes. Um, you even had like the wonderful um, wartime recipes where they basically put carrot into everything. So you had carrot Christmas pudding and carrot mince pies. Fill it out a bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was because they were also vaguely sweet. Yes. So they took up the place instead of sugar. Years ago, and I, I say years ago, I'm sort of 60s and 70s, a lot of people used to put up a lot of decorations in their houses. Whereas now it tends to be the tree and balloons and things like that, if you're lucky. But there's a, there don't seem to be, we mentioned paper chains, there don't seem to be as many. No, I, I think you're right there. And, and I grew up in the 80s and there were all the sort of the, the concertinary foil things. That's right, yes. Yeah, um, that you used to hang up from sort of corner to corner and in your light meeting in your light fixture in the middle of the room and things. Yes, yeah. yeah. No, uh, yeah, you still can get those. And a lot of them are made in South Wales, actually. Are they? Um, there's a massive factory in South Wales that makes basically makes uh, half the tinsel in the world. Well, it's nice to hear um, it's still going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the tree has become more of a focus. Um, and I think that's kind of a shame, really. I kind of still like the foil dangly things. Yes, I, I used to like them. And I sparkle to them. Yeah, and, and um, coloured lights were always a thing on trees, whereas everybody seems to have, or certainly some of the houses I go, it tends to be, to be a white light nowadays. Yeah, and, and I must admit that I can't stand blue ones. I think no. they look horrible. No, it's um, but yeah, no, the, I, I've still got a, um, a set of my grandparents' old um be 1950s um multicolored lights with the big proper old glass bulb that's it yeah 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 i, I run them on a dimmer so i don't blow the bulbs off no no i mean I, I think in the in these sort of times at the moment with people watching their um bills for electricity i think they would uh they would cut off a couple of power stations wouldn't it if everybody had it would, those. yeah well, well thankfully leds are a light yeah. lights are a lot more efficient <laughs> than the old um, incandescent ones so you can run um, ten strings of LEDs for, for one old light bulb. <laughs> yes, and those and then those ones you can get and put on trees outside just with a, a couple of two or three AA batteries. That yeah, last they're, they're pretty efficient, <laughs> aren't they? So where, where's Christmas going, James? I, I, well, I don't mean question. from a religious point of view because that will carry on, but I mean, I mean, yes. you know, from a, a sort of traditions and, and what people do with the day and everything. Yeah, I, I think um, as the country is becoming more multicultural, especially in the last 10, 15 years, um, we're inheriting a lot of the traditions um, from around Europe, certainly. Yeah. And in much of Europe, Christmas Eve is the big day rather than Christmas Day itself. Christmas, Christmas Day is a, a day to have off after you've spent all of Christmas Eve evening eating. Yeah. Um, so I think we might see more of that happening with um, Christmas Eve becoming bigger, um, not outshining Christmas Day, certainly, right. but it becoming more of a like a, a pre-Christmas day, like Boxing Day is a post-Christmas day. Yes. Um, so so I, I think I, I can see that happening. And, and also the food that we eat. Um, we might be eating more european delicacies rather than just turkey um yeah i, having... I know um local butcher they tend to offer um roast beef as well a beef as well to roast uh, a lot of people seem oh, to be yeah, going I mean, for that uh, beef historically was the christmas meal um 
all throughout history until turkeys arrived yes. really i mean turkeys really became big in the mid late 1800s before that it was generally beef down south and pork up north yes um so yeah um it could be the yeah i I think it's interesting um, how things will develop. Yeah. Um, it might be that it becomes less of a thing. Um, and certainly, I think this year, after coming out of two years of not being able to celebrate together, um, it seems like Christmas shopping is very much on the up again. Yes. Um, but whether things like pantos, whether things like having big Christmas parties will ever be quite the same, I don't know. Or whether some people are happier with a, a quieter Christmas now. Who knows? It'd be interesting to see how it develops, won't it? Yeah. Yeah. So if, if there are any listeners who would like to find out more about the history of Christmas traditions in the UK, um, are there are there sources available on your site? I mean, it, like I say, it's a fantastic site with lots and lots yeah. of resources. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a page on my site um, in the Christmas traditions and customers section yeah. um, devoted to Christmas history in the UK. Um, That's brilliant. And and sorry. a lot of that obviously we've covered today. But if they want to find yes. out more, there's, there's more there as well. <laughs> there's more there yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. So, what current up and coming projects do you have that we'd like to tell listeners about, James? Um, well, I'm I'm working on a couple of um, new countries to go on the site. Hopefully, they'll be up sometime this week, um, depending on what other things happen. Yeah. Um, I'm always thinking of other Christmas things. If you can't get out to a um, Christmas carol service this year, I actually um, created a carol, an online carol service during the first lockdown, oh, right. thinking that it might be handy. Yes. Um, for people not knowing what was going to happen at Christmas 2020. Um, so if you go onto the site, whychristmas.com and on the front page, there's a big button that says online carol service and you can either go through it on the site or there's a link to it on YouTube and it's about 35 minutes and it's a sort of a little traditional Christmas carol service and oh, you get me doing the reading. Oh, well, that's nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's nice for people um, who aren't able to go out on that day. Yeah. That. And, and I heard during um, 2020 and 21, um places like care homes yes. um put it on for their residents as well which is just like lovely i, I think that's so, great yeah. james i think you're doing a great job with that site you know I, I urge people to have a look at it there's lots of stuff to go on and, and like you said that you know if you want to want to have a go at a service that you've got that as well but the fact that you, you know you're giving up your time to do it and people getting something out of it i think it's, it's a fantastic service well, thank you very much. Yeah, I just love running it. And as you can tell, I'm quite happy to talk about Christmas all day long. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, if people go on whychristmas.com. Yep, um, whychristmas.com. Yeah, and then you've got your links to YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. And Facebook and, and all the other places. Well, uh, James, thank you ever so much for coming on the show. It's been great talking to you. Well, thank you very much for having me, and it's been brilliant to talk to you. Have a good Christmas. And happy Christmas to all you, to you and all your listeners. Thank you. listening to undercurrent stories i hope you enjoyed this episode please feel free to share the show link to your friends and family and if you have 60 seconds i will be most grateful if you would please rate and review to hear more episodes please subscribe to the show and visit undercurrentstories.com if you leave your email in the link we will notify you as soon as new episodes are released also check out our social media links details of which can be found on the show notes Until next time, this is Bob Wells wishing you all the very best.